I am going to, we're going to bring up our next uh, two guest uh, speakers and get them on the screen for you while I introduce them. And we're gonna start what we are calling a fireside chat with two amazing human beings, um, Daisy Hernandez and Teen Zhao, both from Zwara. And in a minute, we will have all three of us on screen together, I believe. Lovely to see you. Hello, hello, hello. Great, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. Great to see so, you. Good to see you. All right, so what I will do is I will get us started with introductions, which I have to ask the audience to be patient because these are two very accomplished human beings. So the intros might be a little long, but then we'll get into a more, a less formal uh, conversation about some of the things that we're talking about. So uh, we have Teen Zhao, who is widely recognized as one of the thought leaders in the software as a service industry. He founded a company, Zwara, in 2007. As Zwara's CEO, uh, Teen has not only built one of the fastest growing companies, he's also evangelized and remarkably manifested the shift to a subscription-based business model and the complex billing structures um, that they inherit, coining the phrase that we all now know, the subscription economy. And in an effort to empower this new economy, Tina spent over six years working with the best companies in the world to build an award-winning platform, powerful and flexible enough to fuel any subscription business. Uh, before Zwar, which is an accomplishment in and of itself, uh, Teen was one of the original forces at salesforce.com, and he was, I think, employee number 11, which is remarkably um, impressive. He holds a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Cornell, Cornell University. Go Big Red. Go Big Red. And he has a master's in uh, business administration from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. So to say that he's a visionary is an understatement. And we are so grateful to have you with us here today, team. So welcome. Thanks, Laura. And equally impressive, absolutely, is Daisy Hernandez, the Chief Strategy and Operations Officer for Zora. Um, she's, I've been, I've been at Zora for a couple of years now, but she brought, I think, more than 20 years of enterprise software experience to Zora. Hard to believe, Daisy, you don't look old enough to have 20 years of experience. <laughs> I felt um, I wish I, I wish I felt younger. <laughs> I know I'd say those things 20, 30 years. I was like, how'd that happen? Um, but uh, before Zora, you were the global vice president of product for the collaboration and communities portfolio of SAP mm -hmm. and responsible for leading. You're sort of one of these cross-functional organization types and you drive business growth. And I do mean you actually drive it. Um, having now known you and worked with you a bit, you are a driver of, of things. <laughs> Uh, prior to SAP, uh, Daisy held leadership roles in business operations, engineering program management, and software development, and a long list of notable uh, high-tech and telecommunication, telecommunication companies, which I won't list them all out. You can read her bio on the, on the uh, website. And Daisy is a graduate from the University of California in Berkeley with a BS in chemical engineering. So you both have engineering in common. Yeah. Please don't hold it against me that I'm not a Cornell uh, graduate. <laughs> we will not. In fact, what I will say about you having no, known you now for a little while is not only you're a natural leader, you also sort of are, in my opinion, a naturally born systems thinker. So I'm looking forward to people hearing more from you. Uh, so as I said, we've been fortunate to know uh, Daisy and her work recently uh, in, in some of the things that Sawara is dealing with in, unfortunately, enormous success and growth and the things that come along with that. So welcome to have you here as well and um, looking forward to hearing your expertise and having that shared with the audience. So this morning we've been talking a lot with uh, a lot of different people and we've been focusing a lot on systems thinking and I wanted to sort of shift gears just for before we start our chat to to get the audience sort of familiar with the ideas that we're going to be talking about around systems leadership and in particular the way that we have talked about systems leadership being comprised of you know, a vision, which is the desired goal state of an organization, the mission, which are, um, you know, the actions that we do repeatedly to bring about that vision. Um, a little bit about uh, how we build capacity in organizations to, to do their mission. And then also that, that really critical learning function that all organizations that are successful need to have. So I just wanted to sort of shift the gears for the audience a little bit. So Tina, I wanted to start with you. 
in sure. our chat. Any question in the world, this is the question I would ask and I get to do it. So, you know, your vision is a world subscribed and that is an amazing, big, great vision. Can you talk about what it means to you successfully with Sawara? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, that, that phrase actually came about in, um, in the work that we did together. And so this is going to be going back maybe maybe about nine or 10 years with, with you and Derek and is our introduction to the whole VMCL structure. And you, know, you, you start a company in the early days based on some vision. And the visions aren't always as clear in terms of the words, right? Maybe they're clear in your mind, uh, but the words eventually come. And our, our vision was, you know, we had spent, I had spent, you know, with a collection of other folks, Mark Benioff, Parker Harris, um, 10 years, uh, almost 10 years, trying to figure out what this, what the internet means for the software industry, right? So this is starting in 1999. And, you, you know, just to help folks sort of place the date in, in 1999, when we started Salesforce, um, we didn't have high speed bandwidth in the home, right? There was no DSL. I think my, 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 my paper at, um, at Stanford was about who's going to win out their DSL or cable modems back in those early days. Um, there was no Wi-Fi in hotels. And so we were asking salespeople to you know, unplug the phone, plug it into their laptop, dial up with the 56K modem, right? You know, all the noise associated with that. And, and then you would watch you know, the web page scroll on the screen. So it's very, very early. Um, but we believe that the internet was going to change software. And if you simplify the next, next 10 years, it was really about two things, We're trying to figure out what this model that we call the cloud model or right? how to make that work. But the second was how to make the business model work, which we now call this, this subscription-based um, business model, the subscription economy. And so we said, you know, hey, we just spent you know, nine, 10 years trying to figure this out for one company. Can this apply to all companies? And can this apply to all industries? And after giving it some thought, you know, we really believed it could. We, we saw there's about maybe two, three million people at the time that weren't buying DVDs anymore because this little company called Netflix, right, would send you the DVDs over the mail. Uh, we looked at a company called Zipcar and saying, you know, all these New Yorkers, uh, they, they wouldn't buy a car, but they all had a Zipcar membership in case they needed a car, right? This, this predates Uber, predates Lyft. And so our vision was if, if the world was going to change to a subscription economy, then how can we be the company to, to help make it happen? And so that was the length of our words and the sessions we had, right? And then at some point, I don't know if you or Derek or, or somebody said, well, aren't you just talking about the world subscribed? And we're like, that's it, right? And we had the diagrams, right, that we drew to, uh, to evoke that. And so, um, uh, you know, that was a one whole day of working on the vision to arrive at three words. Um, but it was, it was certainly, you know, time well spent and, and it's been driving, those words have been driving our vision ever since. Yeah, yeah, it was a great day, and I, I'm sure I, I'm sure that Derek is the one who uttered those words, if, if I can remember. But I'd like to take credit. But it's a fantastic vision, and I'm wondering, just um, you know, for the sake of the audience, can you can you talk a little bit more about the implications of a subscription economy and sort of what the wider benefits are that we talked about in some of those sessions as to like the things that really drove you to to want to accomplish that. Yeah, so we had to articulate our mission, and, and, and you, know, you, you all know this, the mission is one thing you could do, and that was torture, right? That was a whole nother day of just, you know, distilling it down to one, one thing, and so I've had the pleasure of invoking that torture on everybody else, saying, no, no, no you can only do one, one thing, one mission, and, and uh, we said, look, at the end, it always sounds obvious in hindsight, we have to help companies be successful in the subscription economy. And we have really have to help them grow. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the business, we're about growth, right? New passive growth are really launching new digital services, right? That, that, that your customers use to get the outcomes they wanted versus, you know, forcing them to buy a product and figuring it out from there. Uh, we have to help them uh, know, right? Understand really, really what's going on. Uh, all the data, right? This is a very different business model. And, and how do I find the data to know what I should be doing? And, uh, and we had flow. Right, which ultimately, yeah. you know, we're a, we're a software company. We're a set of tools to help you know automate a set of processes in the background, and um, and so that that's changed a little, right? Just like the VMCL, the vision doesn't change much, but the mission changes, and so we do a lot more than grow flow. 
-hmm. and, uh, and know these days, uh, but certainly the top level mission of helping companies be successful or what now we say win in the subscription economy is, is, is something that stuck with us today. So you can see all that early work that we did over 10 years ago is, is still driving very much uh, the company today. Yeah, and let's, that's great. And let's fast forward a decade and Daisy, you walk in to Zawara as the new chief strategy and operations officer and you walk into this massively successful company with this amazing vision and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what your role is and how you fit in in terms of driving the stuff that's gonna to lead to helping communicate that vision and, and get people onboarded. I know you're having a lot of growth, just maybe a little bit about what your experience has been. Oh, yeah. Um, and not, not to mention when I joined, it was right, right at the beginning of the pandemic too. So having, you know, that clear focus on the vision and a singular focus on mission, which I am after, after the time that we spent on my organization, I'm totally bought into because it certainly helped drive people towards what it is that we need to do in that stabilizing force. And um, if I talk about strategy and operations as it as it relates to Zora, I put it in three buckets. First is strategy alignment. Strategy is going to evolve, but how do we make sure that we are consistent in how we think about it, shared mental models around how we think about our strategy and what it actually means so that people really internalize it so that we can translate that into action. So that's the second part. How do we make sure that we have a system in place such that it's driving progress towards our growth? And then do we have the systems and data to help power that transformation and support the growth? Um, especially because it's, you know, where we're growing very fast and what's been happening in the last couple of years in particular is also in the middle of the great resignation or great reshuffling. So the more we have to have clarity in our vision and mission as well as really understanding when people have different mental models of how they're thinking of things, because we have to make sure that we are hearing and understanding as new people join so that we can continue to move very quickly as well. Um, so it's, it's interesting because as I just heard Teen talk about where Zora was 10 years ago when starting um, this work on VMCL and he had shared with me the magic that happened I mean, I have to admit, I was a little skeptical. It's like, okay, well, you know, how do we make sure that this vision and mission doesn't just sound like what people typically assume when they work in very many companies is that it's just marketing speak. It's just for us to make us feel good. And what really, really resonated with everybody was the work we did on identifying how do we know we are successful in this vision? And how do we know that we are successful in our mission and going through that exercise, because it took us a day too, uh, to <laughs> when I applied it to my organization, um, it was really mind blowing for them. Um, and, uh, and it's meaningful. It's actually meaningful where just a couple of days later, it's starting to actually be part of how we talk to each other and how we talk um, across, uh, across the organization. And we have it, and we're just starting on the, uh, I think the term that we use, enculturation yes. of my organization um, into really understanding it. Um, but they're already starting to do that in just the way that they process. That's great. Well, and if you think about also, uh, you know, many of the, there's a lot of people in the audience and some of them are coming from, you know, different, different perspectives and some are in business and some are, you know, running nonprofits and some are academics, but they all have one thing in common, right? They're interested in systems. And they're interested in taking a systems approach to things. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about sort of what, what, why you had that sort of intuition, either, either or both of you, to sort of know that you needed to take a different approach, land on the fact that it was sort of a systems-based approach, and then how that's really shaped, you know, all of your work in the last decade and, and how it shapes what you're doing today you know, that sort of systems. I know you say system of systems, team of teams, all that kind of stuff. How does that languaging of that systems and that approach shape what you do? Well, maybe I'll start with you. One of the things about a startup that, that, that can be different from other companies is, is the growth. And so uh, you're blowing, blowing through successive phases of growth, if you will, right? And there's lots of ways of measuring phases of growth, uh, organizational size. Organizational size often implies 
um, the depth of the organization, right? How many layers of management, where decision making is. Um, the other thing about startups is, is they go through different, you know, phases of the business model. Mm -hmm. And so you go through a phase where you just acquire new logos, and then you go through a phase of saying, hey, how do, how do I be successful and grow with my existing customers, at least as a, as a recurring revenue business? Um, so one thing that I know Derek came up with was this concept called Padre, right? He was listening to us. And it was this idea that, look, at the core of the business, right, is, is acquiring pipeline, right, is, is acquiring customers, generating pipeline, acquiring customers, deploying the customers, you know, making them happy while they run and then finding ways of expanding. And that Padre really drove, drove us. In fact, you know, we actually put it, you know, we wrote a book about uh, the subscription economy. The last chapter is Padre, mm -hmm. right? So this simple mnemonic that Derek came up with is now like being read by like, you know, hundreds of thousands of people out there and saying we should put in Padre. Now, the funny thing is a couple of years after we put it into the book, we said, you know, the, the Padre structure, and, and this is, you know, this is why C, right, the C part of the VMCL changes more often, um, served us really, really well in that phase where we were acquiring customers. And then we kind of took the expansion phase as a, as a given. But now all of a sudden we wake up and we have lots of different customer segments, right? Big customers, small customers. Uh, we have lots of different products. And we found that we had tuned the system to be really, really good at acquiring and getting customers live and then just sort of, you know, letting them grow. But now we were closing these big companies where the first step was actually just a small part of the big company. And then we had to go build that, that expansion muscle. And so we've been, you know, um, sort of retuning, rethinking our systems. And that's where Daisy's been a big, big part of this. That's where we say, look, maybe, maybe we should just bring uh, Derek and Laura back, right? And because uh, it sure seems like, you know, we need an evolution of the capacitive systems that people have, right? And, and, and even the word capacitive systems, right? Uh, we, we, we simplify it down a little bit. Um, we just call it a mental model, right? It's, it's what are the mental models that, that we need to have? And ultimately, yes, it is a system. Yes, it is a system of systems, but you have to simplify it down to you know, easy mental models that people can grasp, yep. retain, and then it really drives a lot of the alignment in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the day-to-day -day work. Right. And not only the simplicity too, because people can feel very overwhelmed with how much we may have to transform. And so this idea of breaking apart, what are the different systems, realizing that they're all part of a whole, but just taking it step by step. Because one of the things that Laura, you had said in my intro is that you know, you're a systems thinker. I'll be frank with you. I didn't know that I was a systems thinker until you'd said, by the way, the way that you think, I can tell you're a systems thinker. Yeah. Um, and I was frustrated with why was it that my organization couldn't think or understand that we needed something. So your question was, how did I intuit that we needed to take a look at and reevaluate? Was that I was seeing a lot of great hard work of wanting to make progress, but people couldn't really understand why is it that when we're talking about these issues, or we're trying to solve different complex problems, we seem to be talking past each other. Yeah. Or we don't yeah, seem to, right, very big design. And we also don't seem to be able to figure out what the pattern is so that we can move quickly. Um, it feels like every problem is different when in actuality, there's a commonality. Right. And I just had this feeling like it's, there's got to be a faster and better way to do this. And um, that's when speaking with you, having that language around, and, and we use the same thing, mental model. So now all of my leaders are using mental model. Um, now they're recognizing that they have a mental model already on how something is supposed to work. And so I have, so that our CIO is uh, responsible for all of our systems and data. We'll call him Paul. And I also have our head of corporate data, Carl. They both want the same thing, yep. but they have a different way in which they think that we should get to that same end goal. So I'm gonna use um, something that Derek said is always go back to puppies. People can't argue with puppies, go back to the higher level. Like, do we agree that this is what we want? And as soon as we did that, they're like, okay, now I'm listening. and drawing out how you're thinking about this in this way, you seem to have some experience or framework. 
you're using words, but they mean, they seem to sound to mean something different. Mm -hmm. And then getting them to draw out and explain. And then the other person realizing, oh, I actually understand what now they're talking about. Let me share mine. But how many of us, when we see this, people have their mental models and they think that the goal is to just convince each other yeah. of what that mental model is. And then they create stories in their head as to they're just stubborn, they're just this and that. And so recognizing that and seeing that happen live helped unlock a lot of miscommunication already across my leadership. And that in itself has already seen a lot of progress in terms of just making sure that we're listening, hearing, and being open that we may have different ideas of how something should be working. Right, right. I mean, it's funny, I, I have this terrible habit now that you guys gave me, right? So, um, and, and my team makes fun of me, right? So in a restaurant, because you all gave us the blocks, right? And I don't know what happened to the blocks, uh, actually, you know, a few office moves and they seem to, they're probably in some toy box somewhere in somebody's <laughs> home, but, uh, but I'll be, you know, in a restaurant. I've got to reach for something. I've got to reach for the sugar packets. I've got to reach for the salt shaker, right? You know, the, the same thing during my interview. Small. Exactly. Well, here's the cup and this is what that represents. And let's put some sugar packets here. And the yellow, white sugar packets mean this, the pink, pink sugar packets mean this, because you're just trying to, you're trying to tease out what's in people's heads. Right. And uh, they're like, no, 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 that's not it. And they start moving the sugar packets around. And, um, but you know, these, these concepts to really bring out people's mental models is, is, is where a lot of the richness of the conversation lies. Right. Otherwise you, you're just, you're just talking over each other. Yeah. That's actually what got me excited about joining, uh, about joining Zora, by the way, team. You did that during dinner. <laughs> and I was like, well, it started making me think and want to problem solve, actually. So great technique. <laughs> That's great. We, we can credit that to uh, Derek's father. He did that at the dinner table every night. And we hear stories of it. And now it's at our dinner table every night. So that's a great story. Um, I guess one of the things that I think would be interesting and we're thinking about is, you know, how... How has this shift to mental models shaped the culture of Zora? What are the impacts that you've seen? I'm sure people in the audience are all in different types of organizations, and that might be an interesting thing to, to know about, you know, how that shifts and changes culture. Um, are, you, are you guys still offering that black belt of, uh, of uh... You should do those certifications? Yeah, that's sort of, I, I got to go out there, right? Eventually, I got to. I got to play the sax. I've got to like break 90 on the golf course and I got to go get my black belt and uh, DRSP. Um, you know, we, we had a vision of training a bunch of folks in the organization. I always thought that maybe that's something we should have done. It's hard. It's hard for people to, uh, to come up with these systems, right? You need, you need some practice. You need some sessions, all right? And that's why, you know, you guys should just move to the Bay Area so that we can just send people in. Ithaca is just so far away. Um, you're an alum you should want to come back every once in a while no but it's hard to drag everybody else there so <laughs> but yeah uh, no I'll, I, I miss the hot truck um and so um but you know having those mental models is, is what allows you to shape right is giving people a common set of mental models does allow you to shape the culture and so we i would say you know index pretty high in collaboration Right, companies have cultures, and, and there are cultures, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, probably Oracle, where there's a lot of internal competition, mm -hmm. right? And that's not really us, right? We want to really bring a bunch of folks together, right? We were highly influenced by, and we still use the videos of, uh, you know, the birds, right? The sparrows flying around, the eagle comes in, and then, or the minnows, right? Or, I don't know, the minnows are sardines, and the shark comes in. Yeah. And so, you know, how do we really work, you know, together as one team, even as we grow, grow the organization? And it's hard, right? It works for a while and you can sort of see you hit a different level of scale and you got to step back and you say, what are the new mental models that we need everyone to, uh, to hold? But when you can do that, then, then you wind up uh, ideally collaborating and it's never perfect, right? It, it's, it's, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's not as simple as birds, I guess, right? But um, what we're doing is complex, what we're doing is innovative. But just constantly really giving people a set of things to think about, right, as a system in their head. And they might not even be aware of it, right? But, but you know, we don't really think about, I don't know, the system of traffic lights, right, or, or, or 
yeah. or roundabouts, right? But we all know how to do it and then we can all operate together. And so the work then for leadership is to constantly come up with, with the right mental models for, uh, for the organization to hold. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, when I think of culture, I think of language, right? Common language, traditions, AKA norms, behaviors. Um, and it's actually embedded in our mission for my org. Um, it's powering our CEOs, which is what we call our employees, mm -hmm. to sync up, which is making sure that you know that it is important that we collaborate and align and make sure that we're doing that up front to scale up because we have to scale in order to continue with the pace of our growth. And then last is the vision is success together because of the nature of my organization, which is purely cross-functional and is and in service to the company. It's the success of our employees, our CEOs, is overlapping with the success of our customers and overlapping with the success of the business and really understanding that we are a part of a greater whole. Like we ourselves are a system within a system. And um, we even have measures in our mission on how well we are syncing up. Right. And um, that's how deeply we wanted to make sure that our vision and mission was also a reflection of how we want to operate and what kind of culture we want to develop so that we are attracting the kind of talent that we want to, uh, and also retain the kind of talent that we have, um, especially in, in times like this. Right. Right. Hearts and minds, right? <laughs> yeah. Not on websites or in frames, always yeah. in the hearts and minds, just like the fish and the birds. It's in their hearts and minds. They know what they have to do. Right. I mean, I guess, uh, if I think back to, you know, from where you started to where you are, you know, teen in particular, and then Daisy, I have a separate question for you. I'm wondering if, you know, you could speak to, there's, there's the power of understanding and using this VMCL systems leadership model when you're starting something. And then, and this is where Daisy comes in. And there's the power of using it as things are changing right, inside an existing organization. And I'm wondering if you can give the audience some insight into how that same approach can be useful at both phases in the life of a company, you know, at the beginning. And then also as you're going through what you were talking about, these phases of growth, which are very significant for you all and pose challenges as well. If you could speak to that, that might be uh, sure. really helpful. Yeah. So, um... I mean, the simplest thing is, is the pyramid structure that you have, right? And, and the idea that, you know, the vision doesn't change much. It might never change, right? Um, but you might tweak it. The mission changes, I don't know, every few years. The capacity systems change uh, much more often. And the learning systems are probably constantly changing, right? Because you're trying to figure out what, what, what are the different phases. And, um, yeah, I, I, we're not as disciplined, right? But the idea was to have a blueprint of that. And then have a process, have a process. It could be an annual process. It could be a biannual process to really go back and, and ask yourselves what part of those things simply are, are breaking. And, um, and so, you know, you can do that formally or you can do that more on an organic basis. But, but the question really often is, um, you know, a gut check on the vision and mission. And so our mission, for example, had all companies and we had a, a you know, uh, a conversation internally about like, are we really servicing all companies, which would take us down a path, or do we really want to serve the best companies, right? And and so those words really, um, really forced us to confront to that, and we landed on you know best companies uh, for a whole set of reasons. Eventually, maybe all, but right now, it's 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 best companies, and so that was one uh, important tweak that we had. Um, but then the capacitor systems, right? And, and you have a, you could do that on an annual basis, but you could also do that organically. Mm -hmm. So we have a sense, right? Of, um, uh, it is what Daisy said, right? When, when it seems like people are talking through, over each other, when it things like, you know, they have, they're, they're stuck, they have the same goal, but they're not quite sure how to get there together. That's usually a sign that something in the capacitor system is, is a miss. Uh, you don't want to go too far with that. 
right? You can certainly sort of push other capacitive systems down, but you can't overload the whole organization with, with too many of them. Mm -hmm. And okay. so there is a discipline of saying, okay, well, what are the, you know, the, 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 the smaller set, three, four, five, right, mm -hmm. systems that, 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 that really drive um, the whole company. And so we always think about, well, there's a business model system, there's an organizational model system, mm -hmm. right? Um, right now we have an execution model. We, we simply adopt it or um, uh, the OKR system. Yep. Right, that, that worked pretty well. And so that, that's our execution system, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but what are those specific systems that we have to put in place? The, the other thing that we did, the growth flow note became, um, after that meeting, the nine keys. Uh, and we needed a common framework for customer success. Right. Eventually, that also broke um, as our customer base got a lot more complex and, and diverse. Mm -hmm. And so we have a whole journey to usership framework now, right? And you can sort of see in those two words, um, we have to go on a multi-year journey with our customers that has different phases, right? And if we don't set up the mental model with that upfront, then all we do is we work with the customer, we get them live, and then we move on, right? And so now yeah. we say, okay, we need a journey to usership. And, you know, we have a whole organizational model then, then, then that flows from that. And so at the time we have what we call, this is the you know, software industry term, hunter farmers, right? You know, salespeople that sell a customer and then throw it over. And we got to get rid of all that stuff because it, yeah. it just didn't flow from uh, the, the mindset of a long-term customer relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are great examples of how you adapt those mental models as the situation dictates it. And that, and you know, just like the things we were talking about earlier, the bird, that's when you're turning, when you need to turn as to do that super organism to adapt yeah. to those external changes. So I think that's great. And then, you know, your work as the leader is to sort of align people around that new mental model as you're navigating the change. And I'm wondering if, if you can talk a little bit about you know, the current challenges you're facing as you're experiencing like massive growth and thankfully a lot of great success, you know, maybe even ahead of pace remarkably, which is great. And what do those challenges look like and how does this help you navigate that? Or how are you navigating that, I should say? Um, well, COVID and, and you know, being remote is a big thing. And, and Daisy's been a, a huge partner in trying to think about like, you know, we've had to hire, I've had to hire a whole leadership team. Um, and I've had her people, I've hired people that I didn't get to meet, right? Running huge, huge chunks of the organization. And so maybe you could talk to some of the techniques that we've done Daisy to, to say, well, how do we, yeah. how do we, I'd say the simple answer is the mental models are that much more important mm -hmm. uh, because you can't count on a lot of face-to-face -face for that to spread. Yeah. Uh, and crystallizing that, but Daisy, what are some of the things that you would say we've had to wrestle with yeah. in, this, in this more distributed environment? Right. Um, first and foremost, um, it's how do we get people's voices and people have different ways in which they express themselves, right? You're, you're pretty limited on body language. Um, I'm pretty animated, but not everyone is. Um, you're limited even in facial expressions. Not everyone is very expressive, right? Um, and then because we're all in this chiclet, as Teen puts it, yeah. And you have a number of people on. How do you how do you get through in speed where people feel heard, people feel like they have a voice, and also um, we do that as quickly as possible because you know there's only so many hours of the day. And uh, we've been playing around with a lot of techniques, breakout rooms, smaller group. Um, we write a lot now. Um, sometimes it's just putting a blank page. And when I see people talking past each other, I just, I'll just throw it up there and I'll just say what people are saying. And they're like, oh, that's not what I meant. That's not what I said. Um, or we do different kinds of um, commenting techniques where we'll have a question and everyone just now is trained where they'll put in their initials and put their comments in and uh, we'll time bound it, right? So no one's hogging the mic, so to speak. Um, and people can show up in different ways. Um, and, we, and, we, um, uh, and we also allow for discussion, right? So we don't spend a lot of time presenting to each other. So we've shifted a lot more to pre-reads, which, or that are, we sit silent for five, 10 minutes just to read through something. Um, because that way we're not wasting time on consumption of information, but really truly having an engaging discussion about a particular topic or decision that we have to make. 
Um, and we've been playing around with, with different um, ways in which we're doing that. I'm even experimenting with my own organization first um, and, um, and vice versa. And then just seeing the differences in, in how uh, people are adopting them. That's great. That's great. You know, as we're talking, people in the audience are starting to send some questions. So I'm going to I'm going to stop hogging all of my questions and I'm going to share a couple from the audience, see what you all think. So the first one is uh, from an audience member who says I've been with startups as an HR leader for the past five years. And one of the toughest challenges I've been dealing with is to scale early stage employees post A and B rounds. It's it. It is faster and easier instead to bring in more experienced professionals with the funds available due to the rapid growth demanded by the investors, but creates a culture of we versus them. How could systems thinking be applied here? Yeah, so um, Daisy knows this, right? Um, look, one of the things is you start to see everything, right? You start to, 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 to try to see the underlying systems that are in everything. And the underlying systems in, that I see in HR are hierarchical organizational structures, right? And um, in hierarchical organizational structures, it's not that they're bad, but they result in competition, right? right? And, and there's only one role and, okay, who gets the role? Is it the internal person or is it the external person? And it's not easy, but we're trying to really switch to more of a team-based structured mindset. And, um, you know, the engineering organization do that in a sense with scrum teams, right? And um, is there a leader in the scrum team? Well, there sort of is, but is it the product owner? Is it the scrum master? Is it the engineering leader? And they say, okay, well, there's actually two or three leaders. But then you have to really drive clear accountability, right? That who's accountable for what then? And, um, and then you're just creating more room because clearly what you need is you need experience. Mm -hmm. Right, but then you also need institutional knowledge, right. and and you need uh, and oftentimes you know you bring the folks in from the outside, but but um, the problem is sometimes they don't really understand the customer, they don't really understand the product. They will, right, but they didn't go through that same early stage journey um, that that some of the startup folks do. And so, how do you then find a system that accommodates both those things, right? Because ultimately, what you're saying is you need both. Right. I interview that part um, because I'm very sensitive. When I first started, you're like, oh, so what did you do at SAP? And can you just apply that here? Mm -hmm. And I was very in tune with the, look, I, I, I'm coming in and I have to respect what brought Zora to where they're at. And I will listen first to understand what worked and what isn't. Right. Um, and I want to make sure that at least in my organization, when I bring people in, that they are sensitive to that because um, we do need both. You need the institutional knowledge and being sensitive to how you bring people along and how we can make it instead of a we versus them. It's, it's always a we. <laughs> yeah. um, so up front, um, and of course, there's only so much you could do in the interview cycle, but asking about their experiences yeah. of what it was like to have to come in and help rebuild or retool um, and talking up front. In fact, now that I'm very um, uh, attuned to systems thinking is um, I've, I've actually started to talk to my recruiters on how do you find people who already have systems thinking? Cause I'll be frank with you, we're, we're, we're short of that. Um, yes. <laughs> we're short of that, it's work. Yeah, no. Those are great answers. I mean, I think just to highlight, you know, Teen, and one of the things that you you really hit on that I think is important is, you know, we always advocate for this moving moving away from either or solutions and saying you need both, and you can figure out a system to have both. That's right. And then, you know, and and Daisy, I think what you're really getting at is, you know, focusing on the communication and and also you know, you don't walk in assuming that what you learned at the last place is going to work at the next place. You're like, I'm going to understand this system first. And then I'm going to see what I can pull from previous experience or prior things I've done that may or may not fit. So I think those are two great points. And I'm, I'm being cued that I need to, I have another question and then I'm going to, we're going to wrap up in about five minutes, unfortunately. But I have another audience question that uh, either or both of you can speak to, which is, 
Um, do mental models, do, do you find that mental models in systems leadership has been used to increase cognitive diversity within your organization or generally within an organization? Um, yeah, so if you, if you listen to some of the things that, that Daisy described in, in what we do, right? The, the Zoom online environment is really interesting, right? Because um, it's, it's, you know, in, in many ways, like we all grow up knowing how to talk to each other, how to do a whiteboard, right? But you're almost kicking uh, the stool out from underneath everybody because you don't, don't have these, these, these tools anymore. And when you try to do it over Zoom, it, it just winds up being very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have a chance to redo it, right? And to rethink the system because again, when you take a step back, and, and you read the literature on, you know, unconscious biases, right? Um, you know, meeting management, personalities, introverts, extroverts, right? Is, is the existing face-to-face -face systems in the whiteboard uh, are not always, you know, doesn't always work for everybody. You know, people get left out. And as a leader, if you're tuned to it, you do try to like, you know, draw people out and so on and so forth. But in a Zoom environment, when we just throw up a sheet of paper and then we say, everybody just type in what they think, Right. There's um, you're, you actually are building a system to, uh, to 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 make it more equal. Right. And so different people can think in different ways. If right. you can add an async aspect to it. Right. Then there's certain people that, that want to go away, process and then come back. Yeah. They don't yeah. want as much of the real time engagement. Right. And so there's different ways of getting groups of people together in this new environment. That's the potential of this. Right. It's frustrating because we don't know how to use it, but there's certainly lots of potential. And then when you get good at it, and, and it's almost like, you know, like for years and years, we argue that e-commerce should be the basic and the inter-person store experience should be the exception, right? Not the other way around. It's almost like that. Like when you, when you use that as the foundation, then when you do get together face-to-face, -to -face, because there are things that require face-to-face, -face, you've got more of that muscle. You've got yeah. more of that muscle. The group is already trained. If you're, you're already more on equal ground, right? They're more willing to listen to each other. And, and hopefully, you know, you, you could design a much better a group dynamic system. Yeah, that's great. All right, so I have two questions that I absolutely want both of you to answer in the in the next three or four minutes. So it's like an elevator speech. You got to give me a, a quick but good sure. answer. So I'm going to throw it to you first, Daisy. What advice would you offer for young entrepreneurs or graduate students or young people in the audience who, like you, want to? have a position of leadership and in that position also have a positive impact on this world. And then Tina, I'm gonna have you answer that too. What's your advice? What would you say? Uh, develop critical listening skills and really think hard about who the other person is and really spend time understanding human dynamics. Um, I have had a huge appreciation of that in the last two years <laughs> and maybe before. Um, I was conscious of it then, um, but that is, I think, number one, um, because otherwise you don't know what you're working with and um, you won't have, you won't be able to be in a leadership position to help be the bridge if you yourself are not attuned to that yeah. and seeing the disconnects. and leading by example. That's great. That's fantastic. And Teen, what would you say? Um, no, that, that's definitely a, a big look. Uh, the list of advice can be really, really long, but you know, I, I wouldn't overthink it. I think if you're an entrepreneur out there, you wanna do something, you've got a great idea. The most important thing is to, is to jump in and do it. You're yeah. gonna make a ton of mistakes. Right. You know, uh, there are people in hindsight in your career that you're gonna have to go back and apologize to because we're all growing as humans. And uh, as long as you're humble about it, as long as you, you know, excited about it, you're, you're authentic and you get together with a good group of folks that, that are aligned to how you think and, and what you want out of life. Uh, I think it's going to be fine. So the most important thing is just to go do it. That's great. Those are both great pieces of advice. And my final question, I wish we could, I mean, we could talk all day. I could talk all day. We could actually be by a fire and actually talk all day in another, in another time. You know, I, what, what gets you up in the morning? What are you excited about in the future? What are the things that you're thinking about? I'd love to hear that. And then we'll close out our session, our time. 
Um, you know, in this industry, you, you, there's a strong element of, of, of sort of giving back, to, giving back to the next generation, maybe um, certainly giving back to the community. So I certainly find myself spending a lot of time with you know younger entrepreneurs um, or earlier stage entrepreneurs, I should say, right, in their first, third, fifth year of the company. And I, I kind of always go back; they're always wrestling with something, um, and you know try to pull them back to the big picture. And says, this is, if you enjoy it, if you sit back and, and, and really you know, enjoy the ride. And the metaphor I always go back to is, you know, like pick your favorite TV series, right? I think uh, I remember, you know, for a while it was like Game of Thrones. And like, oh, you're just on the first season of Game of Thrones. You had like five awesome seasons in front of you, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I almost uh, wish I was in your position. And so just to think of it like that. Think of it like that, right? It, whatever you're wrestling with, this is just simply part of the journey. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're fortunate enough to be in, a, in, in these positions where we get to do this, right? We get to innovate. We get to work on, on entrepreneurship. We get to work on interesting ideas. These days, um, you know, the impact that you can have just because, you know, everything's all connected mm -hmm. can certainly be great. And, um, and so just, just enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Wow, we have very different answers. <laughs> it's a good thing we're very diverse between the two of us. Um, um, so what gets me up in the morning, what makes me happy is I love feeling like being the like having the multiplier effect. Um, one of my values is harmony. And it doesn't mean that everyone always gets along. And harmony means that we have the space to disagree, to confront conflict in a healthy manner. And then just seeing how going through that and people appreciating and recognizing that at what the end of that is a better outcome and a product. I mean, what I would love to see and what makes me happy is when I see people feeling productive and are able to achieve their personal growth, the growth of the business and the growth of our customers. Yeah. So you can see what happens. I, I stir things up, with Daisy, <laughs> bring everybody together. <laughs> I'm familiar with this. <laughs> I make his ideas happen. <laughs> That's awesome. Listen, I really am sad to say that our time is running out. I really have enjoyed this conversation. I'm looking forward to continue it. I hope that the audience has gotten out of it as much as I have. I'm sure they have. Um, I wanted to actually personally thank both of you. I know that you're both incredibly busy and um, and also congratulate on you on your success. And thank you for all that you're doing to really actually have a positive impact on this world through the subscription economy. So thank you. I will be the Thanks only one who can be clapping. Thanks for coming and uh, we'll see you soon. Great. Thanks for having all us. Right. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun. So we'll do it again anytime. Yes. All right. <laughs> Hope you all enjoy the rest. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.